In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For God has looked with favor on the lowliness of the servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is God's name. God's mercy is for those who fear God from generation to generation, God has shown strength with God's arm. God has shattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. God has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of God's mercy, according to the promise God made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with Elizabeth about three months and then returned to her home. May God bless the reading of this word. So, yes, I am a Mary Wannabe. This is full disclosure. And as long as we're being dreadfully honest in the afterlife, if there's a choice and people say, Who do you want to meet in all of history? Who would you like to meet? And I know everybody's hands goes up and they go, I want to meet Jesus. I want to meet Mary. <laughs> I want to meet Mary. Because I believe Mary is one of the most misunderstood women in history. I believe that through the ages, we have put so much stuff on Mary from being the porcelain princess to what I described to you in the beginning with Diana with her beautiful fluttering eyelashes. To now, we have, in 2019, Mary in a cage as poster child for immigration policies in our country. Amen? We have put a lot of stuff on Mary. And I just want to know who she is. I want to know what it was like for the Holy Spirit to come upon her and tell her that she is going to be pregnant and then to find yourself pregnant. <clears throat> You've said yes to that and then find yourself pregnant and have to face mom. <clears throat> I had to do that once. <laughs> it's not pretty. So here she is. This girl, who is, where is, did Amelia go downstairs? How old is Amelia? Yeah. Twelve. Twelve. Probably as old as Amelia. Who comes to her mom. Now, mom and dad, this, she's from nowhere town. From nowhere parents. She's got really not a whole lot going for her, except somehow her family has gotten together a bride price. That's pretty substantial, actually. Because she is going to be married to the son of a builder, the son of someone from the house of David, the son of someone who is more prominent and above their station than Mary ever could hope to be. This is a huge thing for her family, and Mary is tossing it all away with her yes to the old this mom said, well, we don't know. We can project. We can think about what it might have been like for Mary to go home and tell her mom what happened. 
the disgrace that her family would face. The fact that she and Joseph were already engaged meant that by law, they were already married. So in order to get out of that, she would have had to get a certificate of divorce. Do you know what happens to divorced pregnant women who have disgraced their family in ancient times? They're stoned to death. Here's Mary's future. So how do you get from there to what I just read to you of Mary saying, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit soars within me. God reigns. God has brought down the proud, completely decimated the wicked. God has brought in a new era of peace and love and joy. How does she see that? Moreover, how does she find the compassion for herself to take care of herself during this time? Because I know when you're at odds with your family, especially at a teenager, and you've ruined the family view of what should be their future, it's tense in the house. So, Mary does step one for compassion. She looks inward. She's aware. They're suffering. Their parents are suffering. Joseph will soon be suffering. His family will be suffering. And moreover, she is suffering. So we're going to take a look at what is self-compassion from Mary's perspective. Mary put herself into a place where now she finds herself pregnant, and now she has to do something about it. She takes all stock of what could happen. She could have just stayed and toughed it out. She could have just thrown out the whole thing. She could have begged and pleaded her mom, and maybe she did, to keep her. But instead, Mary decides, let me take myself and put myself out of the situation. Let me remove myself from the fire. This is a big step. Because those of us who are short on self-compassion, we sometimes have a problem moving ourselves out of the fire. Amen? We want to talk it out. We want to work it out. But you know what? Sometimes time is the best healer. Now, Mary doesn't go anywhere. She doesn't go just anywhere. She goes where? To her cousin. What makes this cousin so special? First of all, she's as old as the hills, right? As old as the hills, except she's pregnant. So now she's also in a very difficult to explain pregnancy situation. Mary finds something in common. I'm going to go and see Elizabeth. I'm going to go and remove myself and put myself with someone who might understand what I'm going through. How I got this way that is not of my doing. How many of us actually seek someone out who's <coughs> been through what we've been through when we're suffering? When we need to show a little compassion to ourselves, how many of us would seek out and have the forethought to think, let me find somebody who's been this. Mary does. Rock star. Okay, now, Mary's there. She goes to Elizabeth. She sees the need. She moves herself out of the situation. She goes to Elizabeth. Elizabeth looks at her, understands exactly what's happened. Because Elizabeth is in a similar situation. She's holding who? John the Baptist. Great. She's carrying John the Baptist, so she understands what's going on. She showers care on Mary for three months. She showers care on Mary for three months. This is the next step in self-compassion. Allowing someone to care for you for as long as it takes for you to get back on your feet. This is 
huge. This is not America. This is not first world thinking. Our thinking is, all right, I'll go, I have a problem, I'm gonna go see Victoria for a little while. I'm gonna go and see her and I'm gonna let her make me a cup of tea. And then I'm gonna get myself up and I'm gonna get myself back to the real world because a cup of tea is all I'm going to allow her to give me. My friends, we have love to give each other. We have care, compassion. It doesn't just take one cup of tea. Sometimes it takes a week, a month, Sometimes it takes a lifetime of letting somebody care for you until you heal enough to get back to the real world. You know why I want to meet Mary? Because of the things that have been projected on her. Those same things have been projected on each one of us. Somewhere, under the porcelain princess, under the fluttering eyelashes, under the Madonna figure, under the one who's worshipped and asked for a miracle mama, somewhere under that is Mary for all that. Mary, in these just moments before the world would change with the birth of her son, took time to free herself from what others were thinking, from what others would project on her for the rest of her life. It meant forgiving. It meant forgiving the ones who were going to talk about her. It meant forgiving Joseph for the things that he was going to say to her. It meant forgiving her parents. It meant forgiving God. It meant forgiving herself. great at that. We can think of one thing in our lives, one person in our lives that we forgive. Just take one moment to think of one person you forgive. If you can't think of one, think of one time that you received forgiveness. Hold on to it. It's not an easy thing, but it's the simplest thing in the world. Because what we do when we forgive is free the person under the projections. We free the person that's been told that they're not enough. My friend, you are enough. You are enough. Without anybody's expectation of you without worrying about what you're going to have to do or who is going to take care of you or what's going to happen. You know why? Because, Mary, you are the God-bearer. In Greek, theokotos, they call it. The bearer of God. That's where the awareness comes in. This awareness that Yes, there is suffering around us, but yes, we hold the spirit of the living Christ inside of us. The next step is putting ourselves in an attitude of compassion and being allowed, allowing ourselves to get ourselves off the hook and free that soul inside. I don't know where you are, and I don't know what might be holding your but what it is and what we think of you are two different things. So what I'm asking you to do, perhaps just in this time of reflection, is to think for a few moments about something that is blocking whoever you are under your projections from being free. Free for Christmas. Free to be the God-bearer that God has made you to be. Free enough to stand 
tall and say, my soul magnifies the Lord. I rejoice in the Spirit of God, my Savior. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we move into this time of reflection, we see you, yes. We know that we've said yes to you in our lives. You've asked us to bring good news of great joy to a weary and dark world. You've given us each a light inside of us, yet sometimes we're just doused, doused with other people's stuff of what they've thought about us, told us we are, told us we're not. We ask you to open us up, to allow us to free ourselves, to be who you have desired us to be. We continue in prayer together.